Melania, uh, you know, is a, a fascinating case because I think she has become, well, first of all, I was, you know, I nicknamed her the Slovenian Sphinx. So <laughs> I was very excited to see the Slovenian Sphinx at the Sphinx. Um, that's going to be my <laughs> new screensaver. Um, yeah, you know, it was funny because I first met Melania when she and Trump were dating in 99 when we went to Miami where he put his toe in the water about a presidential run for 2000. And, um, you know, I liked her. She was cool. But um, when I asked Trump why on earth he thought he could be president, he looked at me in a state of shock and he said, first he said, well, I get the best ratings on Larry King. But then he said, Melania has been on a lot of magazine covers. <laughs> like, and a lot of men hit on Melania. And, you know, I called it his ego arithmetic. And that was so, he was using, you know, Melania's beauty as a way to say he should be president, which was weird. But she, um, the, there are two things about Melania. So first of all, the liberals have this fantasy about Melania that, you know, she's kind of sneaking off to women's marches and that she's wearing a pink pussy hat in her separate bedroom. Um, and even one of my editors said to me recently, uh, why don't you do a piece about how Melania would maybe Tom Steyer, the Democratic billionaire, could pay off her prenup and then Melania could talk about Trump, you know, with candor. And I just said, you guys have got to get a grip. You know, that's just not going to happen. Uh, no matter what happens with their marriage in the future, I don't think she's going to be turning into some liberal dream of trashing Trump. Um, you know, we, our photographer, <laughs> is always trying to figure out if she actually lives at the White House. Because there were all these rumors that uh, she had a house in suburban Maryland. And, you know, there are a lot of rumors that swirl around her. But as far as her new interview, you know, the most interesting thing was that she kind of brushed back Rudy Giuliani. And Rudy Giuliani had said that she, you know, uh, didn't believe the Stormy Daniels story, and she said something like, Rudy Giuliani doesn't know what I think. Um, but then she did say she doesn't spend time thinking about Trump's affairs. And, um, you know, we've, it's, it's strange in Washington because um, it's a very staid town in some ways, and yet everything always seems to boil down to sex, which is weird, but it's, uh, Stormy Daniels actually was performing in Washington recently, and I went to see her as research, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you make of Melania's uh, sort of dour expressions when she's in the backdrop with Trump? Well, I think that, um, again, I think that's kind of, kind of part of the liberal fantasy that she's, you know, angry at him all the time. But uh, uh, Tim O'Brien, a Trump biographer, told me that Melania and Donald early on um, sort of decided that the coolest look they could have was the Clint Eastwood sneer in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, so that they both, you know, practice their Clint Eastwood sneer. They think that's a good look for them. When, when you talk about Melania and magazine covers and the, the whole imagery and the beauty, uh, we saw that Nikki Haley, when she left, announced her leaving the UN this week, Trump said she brought glamour to the UN. And that's an, sort of another way he's just so focused on how someone looks. What, what would you say? Yeah, he, I started the Woodward, uh, you know, my plane got diverted because of a medical emergency. To, so I was in Chicago at one in the morning reading Bob Woodward's book. And he was talking about how he cast his cabinet in terms of looks and, um, uh, you know, that he didn't give John Bolton a job right off the back because of the mustache. And he thought Rex Tillerson looked central casting. And, you know, certainly Trump and his father, when it came to uh, who they would marry, were 
into eugenics and what, who would give the best genes and stuff. And here's a funny Melania story. So I'm friends with Andre Leontali, you know, the famous uh, towering mountain Vogue editor. And he styled the Vogue cover on their wedding. And so he went with Melania to Paris to shop for her wedding gown. And he, he told me four things about her, that she's a great mother, that she was very polite to all the couturiers, she wasn't a diva, and that um, she was the best groomed woman he has ever met, and he said everywhere, and that she was the best moisturized woman he has ever met. Now, when did you first, when did you first meet Trump, and how much did you stay in touch with him over the years? I first, this is such, this is such a weird story. I first talked to him in 1987. I was covering Mikhail Gorbachev's first trip to America, and so I called uh, Gorbachev in New York was meeting with a group of New York businessmen, including Trump. So I called Donald Trump and I said. You're meeting with Gorbachev. You know, how do you think that's going to go? And he goes, well, you can't trust the Soviet Union. We should not be making any deals with them. You know, we have to be very skeptical of them. And so then I called him after the meeting, and he goes, I love them. They told me to come build a Trump Tower in Moscow. They're completely amazing. We have to make deals with them. <laughs> that was the first time I realized that one compliment, one sword dance, one whatever can totally turn Trump around and change his policy. And then about a year later, this rumor swept Fifth Avenue that Gorbachev was on Fifth Avenue and Trump races down with his bodyguard and you know, works his way through the crowd and um, to greet Gorbachev. And then um, it turned out it was this New Jersey actor named Ronald Knapp. And this is on YouTube if you want to see it. <laughs> and afterwards, Trump told me, he goes, oh, I was very suspicious because I noticed four attractive women in the limo and a communist would never do that. So actually, our first conversation was about Russia. Does he... When did he last talk to you? Is he talking to you now? No, he stopped. Um, I interviewed him a lot during the campaign, but then when my book came out, you know, I went on um, the Smirconis show on CNN at 9 o'clock on sun Saturday morning, and I was thinking to myself, why am I on here? Nobody's going to be watching TV at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning, but one person was. And uh, he thought I was too critical, and so he began tweeting that I was a wacky, neurotic, dope, which is all the same adjectives he always uses about women journalists. And um, later, you know, I was talking to Jared, and Jared said if I just would do one flattering column and a couple nice tweets, I could get back in his good graces. Um, but obviously, that is not going to happen. So. Have you seen that happen with other journalists? You know, I have heard that sometimes Trump, like, will get on the phone with journalists and, um, you know, say, uh, if you tell me your sources, like, on this, who was trashing Michael Flynn or something, I'll give you a bigger scoop, which was the same technique he would use with the New York tabloids. He would call either as himself or one of his two assumed names where he would play his own press secretary. And uh, he called himself John Barron or John Miller, and he would call the New York tabloids and say, as his own press secretary, you know, Madonna really wants Donald Trump. She is really after him. Or Carla Bruni really wants to date Donald Trump. And then they would, the women would have to issue denials. Um, but that's the technique he used with them, that, um, which is a variation of the National Enquirer, you know, catch and kill kind of thing, where you either offer them something else or a bigger story to get the story you don't want in out. Did you ever think Trump would be elected president? Oh, absolutely not. You know, I went to um, 
Although I wasn't as wedded to the big data thing as everyone else in New York because uh, I think voting for president is the most personal vote you can make and people don't always tell the truth about it to pollsters and uh, you know, it's about your future, your children's future and I'm not sure demographics can always tell you. There's this uh, very chilling scene in Amy Chozik's book, Chasing Hillary, where they have a big data guy who is so brilliant, they compare him to the character played by Russell Crowe in A Beautiful Mind, and he comes into the Clinton suite, and they're all dressed up in their purple Ralph Lauren matching outfits, and some expensive hotel in New York that, as Amy pointed out, was not a union hotel like Democrats usually stay in. And he said, well, you know, we're losing Florida. The model was wrong. And they were alarmed, but they said, well, we've still got Pennsylvania. And he goes, well, if the model is wrong there, it's wrong everywhere. So, you know, I just think that big data can't always tell you everything you need to know. I guess m many of us journalists have asked this question of ourselves, but is there any, just dialing it back, is there any column you wish you had written uh, had you known that Trump would, would end up getting elected? Um, no, I think I was, you know, you know who was open to the idea that he was more potent than people thought was Bill Clinton. He was very worried about it. And in fact, he asked to go out and sort of see what was wrong with white rural male voters, but uh, Hillary's campaign manager just made fun of him using a southern accent and two reporters, to the Boston Globe reporter, actually. And um, so, but the reason I didn't think he could win is I, I went over to Trump Tower to have lunch with him in June when he was headed toward the nomination. And there were literally more pictures of him and cardboard cutouts of him than campaign workers. And he was bragging about that, saying Hillary has all these campaign workers and I don't have anything. And I was just thinking, well, you really can't you know, win if, you, if no one's working for you. And Michael Cohen, who he has now distanced himself from and who is now re-registered as a Democrat, was there looking very nervous, and Corey Lewandowski was there fighting with Hope Picks, but you know, there didn't seem to be a real campaign operation. But also, you know, at the same time, Hillary's campaign was screwing up because she didn't go to Wisconsin. I think she went to Michigan once. She didn't have an economic message. And she just thought she was relying on the awfulness of Trump to elect her rather than, you know, proactively coming up with an inspirational message. So, you know, both of them had like the lowest ratings of any candidate in history, right? You've, is he, diff now, that, now that he is elected, is he behaving differently than you would have expected? Well, at this lunch, I was telling you about, you know, I took my boss and our chief political correspondent, and we were pressing him on, was he going to pivot? Was he going to start behaving as a presidential candidate should? And he would always tell me, I can do that if I want to. You should see me at dinners with Palm Beach matrons. I can be as dignified as anyone. But when we asked him if he was going to pivot, he like crossed his arms and shook his head like a little kid who didn't want to eat broccoli. And, and indeed, he never did pivot. He made everyone else pivot to him. I mean, all around the world, people have had to pivot to him acting like a high chair king, you know, even to the point where they'll feed him hamburgers and ketchup at state dinners and stuff. Are you worried for this country? Um, well, this is interesting. So uh, you guys might know we, we recently had this kind of sensational anonymous op-ed by a senior Trump staffer who said he was a danger to national security, which Woodward also says. <clears throat> and um, 
because of that, they will snatch things off of his desk, agreements, security agreements they don't want him to sign or not tell him things. And uh, this op-ed was so famous that it's now like a Halloween costume on Amazon, <laughs> uh, like a Times newsprint with a big question mark on it. But, um, you know, the message in the op-ed and in Woodward's book is that he is a danger. Um, but I know I'm not known for my optimism, but I still think that someone like Dick Cheney, who, you know, was well-respected in Washington and reporters loved him and had used him as a source and... Uh, you know, there's this new movie coming out where Christian Bale is playing Dick Cheney and the pictures look eerily like him. It seems an impossible transformation. But anyway, Cheney was able to do terrible things and, and it took years for it to come out because he was working within norms, within the accepted norms. And he had that you know, deep headmasters, boys, school boys that sounded very trustworthy. So someone working within norms, you know, and doing bad things makes me more nervous than Trump because when Trump pops off on Twitter about something, everyone can mobilize in real time to stop him. Um, whereas if you have someone who's following norms and wants to do something really bad, it's much harder to catch them and mobilize. Like, how would Pence fit into that? Oh, Pence. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Pence would be more like Cheney. Yeah, he, he has that same deep, soothing voice, and he's working within the norms, but, you know, he has a lot of scary things he would like to implement if he could. So as, as Tom mentioned, um, you're an equal opportunity uh, critic of all presidents. And I remember when you and I went to the White House Christmas party under Bill Clinton one year, and we were in line, and you turned to me and said, I can't go. Like, he hates me. So take my sister. So, so there's this picture hanging up somewhere of me and Maureen's sister and the Clintons, and everyone's saying, who is that? You're like, who is that? But anyway... Um, looking back to all the, when you wrote about W and Barry and Clinton and Hillary and everything, do you have more of a soft spot for any of them given what we've and you've been through with Trump? Um, well, I, you know, I tend to, I don't, I don't really want, I'm not in this business to make friends with politicians or go to dinner parties with them. I mean, I, I take very seriously, which now more than ever we understand this, that we are part of the checks and balances. And, uh, you know, I try to tell young reporters sometimes when I see them covering a presidential campaign and getting to be friends with and uh, cozying up to, they spend every day for a year or two years with these campaign workers, that they are there for the readers. We're there for the readers. We're not there to make friends with strategists. Um, so I think of it not antagonistic, but more, you know, uh, that we are, are watchdogs. I don't know how to talk about it without sounding corny, but that's how I think of it, so. With, with perspective, do you have any kind of revisionist sense of the presidents you've covered, were, were they any better or worse than you thought at the time? No, it's just kind of, what's really discouraging about it, it makes me feel like my whole life's worth work really has no point because, uh, you know, I travel with these people for a year or two before they're elected, we're spending all our time together, so I'm trying to tell the reader everything I know about them. and you know, we're with them more than ever now. There's more exposure than ever. And yet, we really can't ever know, you know, how they're going to be as president. W promised a humble foreign policy, no nation building, bipartisanship, and his presidency was just the opposite. You know, I would have thought traveling with Obama for a year that he would have been 
using his charm and very extroverted and like Luke Skywalker with the force. And then it turned out he was sort of an introvert who didn't like politics. So even when you're trying really hard to tell the reader what someone is like, it's hard because here's what happens. When they get in the White House, even though that should be the most amazing ratification for you, all of their gremlins and insecurities come out, and uh, then you don't know uh, what the wind shear of history is going to be. As Harold Macmillan said, events, dear boy, events. Like, if 9-11 hadn't happened, I think W probably would have been uh, a uh, bipartisan popular president. But if you see the look on his face when Andy Card walks across when he's reading the children's book about the goat, he was terrified. He had spent the first 40 years of his life fooling around. I mean, Tom knows, Tom said, you know, he was a baseball owner and a very fun, charming guy, but he did not feel ready I used to have a picture of that moment in my office because they were going to throw the picture out. And I'm like, you can't throw the picture out. That's history. And the look in his eyes was so scared that I, I had to get rid of the picture because it scared me to see someone in that moment knowing I'm not really ready for this. But instead of rising to the occasion, he basically turned everything over to Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, who had a lot of old agendas. And... I think basically, well, this is what Bush Sr. and Barbara Bush thought, that Cheney you know, had just kind of gone batty at some point, maybe from the five heart operations, but that he was a different person than the one they knew. But I think there were always signs there that he was interested in this hyper-aggressive American foreign military policy. You've been um, such a mentor for uh, younger journalists for so many years, um, men, women that have moved, gone on to careers in journalism. What do you tell them, the youngest ones now who, have just, who are just experiencing Washington for the first time? Do you tell them this isn't normal? Well, yeah, my joke about our White House political reporters is they're never really going to be able to cover anyone after Trump. They'll have to change professions and go be tornado chasers or something <laughs> because the adrenaline rush. And, you know, before Trump, Trump, you know, has this bat sonar where often what something he says really has a germ of truth. And when he says this thing about how journalists are secretly rooting for him, to win again. It's not that they're secretly rooting for him, but it isn't Melania that he has the most passionate, intertwined, obsessive relationship with. It's the press, because he is the selfie president, and we're the selfie stick. He's Narcissus, and we're the mirror. And all of a sudden, there's all this money. Because here, you know, I realized uh, I was watching a show on an old movie channel, and it said Alfred Hitchcock uh thought that this the best key to success for a movie was a great villain so you know the press has a great villain and trump in turn has the press as a villain so it's a mutually toxic dependent relationship where the press is getting rewarded for uh you know, all this money that Trump has brought into cable news, all the reporters in the Washington Bureau have uh, contracts, very lucrative contracts. They're all, you know, buying new apartments <laughs> and new things. And, you know, journalism is flush with money because we have a great villain. It helps the narrative. So, um, yeah, so my advice, you know, to young journalists is, well, actually, you know, I, I started out trying to mentor Maggie Haberman and very quickly realized she should be mentoring me because I would just have to be a cocktail waitress now. I could not do what they're doing. Maggie Haberman recently was being interviewed for a profile about her while she was also on the phone interviewing someone for a story while she was also instant messaging, probably with Javanka, you know, she, and she has three little kids. So, 
<clears throat> she is doing, at, you know, they are able to do everything at the same time. They have TV contracts, they have book contracts. You know, we, the fourth estate, there are documentaries about us they have to be in. Plus, they're breaking, there are 20 amazing stories. When I covered George H.W. Bush, I didn't even think I got in the paper the first six months of his presidency. It was only when he showered with his dog, Millie, that I was able to break into the paper. And these guys, you know, every hour, there's something that supersedes. We did this uh, 13,000 word story about Trump's taxes, which was wild because it showed that Trump, I think Trump was making more than I do as a toddler. <laughs> and then he was a millionaire by eight because his father was putting all these things in his name. So he wasn't just a million that his father gave him. And it barely got any attention because there were 10 other amazing stories and the Kavanaugh thing. So, you know, I just think the adrenaline level and the amount of money washing around because of Trump is nuts. You know, I, th I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think back to that. I remember one time pleading with the editor of the New York Times saying, I, I cannot be the one person covering the presidential campaign. It was a year before the actual campaign year, but it was a year, one person, and he said, just wait till New Hampshire, that's when it gets going. And it does, yeah. and now there's like hundreds. Well, let me, okay, here's a good example, a Boston example. So I spent a year of my life covering Michael Dukakis. I mean, I don't think there was a story the whole year. So finally I was desperate. So we were on a tarmac somewhere and I go racing after him and I said, Mr. Dukakis, what do you do for fun? He didn't even stop. He kept walking and he yelled over his shoulder, black mulch. And I run up to him and I go, black mulch? And he goes, I put black mulch on my tomato plants in Brookline. I'm like, OK, well, that wasn't going to get me in the paper. <laughs> I, I was going to say he, he had a manual lawnmower, that he loved mowing the lawn. And, and that he was, was like reading a book called Swedish Land Use Planning. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so there, there are so many. Um, people who attack someone um, um, like you where you're out there um, with the platform you have, what, um, most of it I'm sure you just, you found a way to just brush off, but what gets under your skin? Oh, everything gets under my skin. <laughs> my family thinks it's hilarious that I'm in this uh, <clears throat> profession that is basically like a Godfather movie where you take one of the, theirs, they take two of yours, you hit the mattresses. Because I was so super sensitive as a kid, I thought that if someone was mean to you or said something critical, that it was sort of like uh, leukemia, you could die of it. I thought you could die from uh, people saying critical things to you. So <clears throat> it's exactly the wrong profession for me. But um, I, I just try not to read anything. I don't. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't read any of the comments under the column or because you would be completely debilitated. <clears throat> the first couple years, I would say the first two or three years I had the column, you know, my skin broke out, my hair was falling out, I, I would come home at night and curl up in a ball on the floor of my house and smear Clearasil on my face <laughs> and eat Popeye's fried chicken. And finally, I went to my boss and I said, I, I just can't do this. I'm not temperamentally suited to this. And he was kind of like, OK, we'll send you back to Metro. And I had been on Metro for 15 years, so I realized it was kind of a one-way street at that point. I didn't want to go backwards. but. You know, in a way, it's like Beyonce has this kind of stage name to help her work up her nerves, Sasha Fierce or something. It's like you have to just have a different persona to work up your nerve and do the job properly, even if, you know, your own nature is shy and non-confrontational. Do you look at traffic? Do you, and do you compare, even though you're usually 
high up do you say, well, why is Tom Friedman higher today than I am? Like stuff like that. Well, you know, this is a, a scary time to be in journalism for many reasons. You know, all the uh, trying to manage tweets and what you can say on Twitter. We had a situation the other day where uh, <clears throat> one of our legal correspondents had her name on a Kavanaugh story, the one about him throwing ice in a bar. And then it turned out she had tweeted her opposition to him at the beginning of the hearings, and the Times had to apologize. So we're negotiating all that. But also, we have these guys now in the New York building who are constantly looking at the, it's like Black Mirror, if any of you have seen that. They're constantly looking at the number of clicks you get and dividing it by your salary, <laughs> figuring out if you're really worth it. And so I very timorously kind of approached one of those guys, and I go, you know, I'm worried about this system you're using. He goes, you're okay this week. <laughs> and finally, before we leave, I just want to give the audience a little sense of what it's like to, to do your job. And you write your own headlines, right? And, and Except even that has changed, because basically, they want Beyonce in every headline. <laughs> what is it called? Audience. Um, they have a word for it. So, you know, I used to do, I used to try and do literary headlines, but that's out. You've got to have a na one word in the headline that gets clicks. So, S, you know, CL what is search, it? Search, search engine optimization. Search engine optimization. So, I, I, I don't. <laughs> So I don't enjoy writing headlines as much because it's got to have Beyonce or Trump or Kanye or something in it that's like, come here, come here and read this. And do you ha are you writing for this Sunday? No, I, <laughs> I just took my conservative brother to Monument Valley for his birthday because he's a big John Ford, John Wayne fan. And, um, you know... It was just a weird time to do it because he was Brett Kavanaugh's high school um, basketball coach, and all my nephews went to Georgetown Prep, which used to be a source of great pride to them, but now Georgetown Prep has uh, <laughs> developed this reputation as a, uh, you know, castle of horrors rape school, which isn't, isn't fair. But uh, anyway, so we were watching the, I had done a couple tough columns on Kavanaugh Ford hearings, and my sister kept warning me that my brother might cancel, but he didn't, and we ended up watching uh, the swearing in together, and then it uh, got to the point where Kavanaugh was thanking his coaches, and Kevin started crying, <laughs> you know, so it, it, that was a weird week. And let... Last question, since this is Hub Week and we're in Boston, um, what do you, th um, just your observations on Boston, do you come here a lot, what do you think of this city? Oh, well I love Boston, and I love the Red Sox. If you're allowed to say that, because sometimes baseball teams don't like it unless you, you know, unless you were a um, fan from the moment you were born, but I do love the Red Sox, and Tom gave me a hat, which uh, I love a lot. And, um, you know, when I come to Boston, the minute I land in the airport, I feel like it's my tribe, it's my people. You know, I feel like I'm home at a family dinner party. And, um, you know, I love it. Well, this was great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. <laughs> and now we have. I will step away for your, your next panel. All right. Thank you both so much. That was great. Can we give them another round of applause?